y'all. It's your girl, Coach Crystal, and welcome to another week of Wisdom Wednesday. If you're just joining us, this is a weekly encouragement vlog. It started as a time that I get to talk to people who I love, admire, learn from, and I get to share those people and those voices with you. So if you're just tuning in, let me tell you, you can watch this on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and you can listen to it on the go on our Spotify channel, which is Crystal Brown's Wisdom Wednesdays. So Without further ado, I want to welcome you into the Steps and Stages community with our mantra that just says, a lot of things happen before this, and I guarantee a lot of things are going to happen after this, but I promise to be here with you now. Please be here with me now. Sometimes we forget that the real gift of our presence is in being present, being present with one another, being present with ourselves, and staying in line with the presence of the vision. Listen, if you don't have your ticket to Vision Camp Live yet, I honestly don't know what you're waiting for. This is the last live event we're going to have this year. I want you to join me in one of the most beautiful states of Vermont during one of the most beautiful times of the year, fall foliage. And I want you to sit down with me for a day so we can design and deploy your vision into a life you love living by design and not by default so that your vision allows you to make better decisions moment by moment to be present with who you are really becoming. If you want your ticket, we'll drop the link below this video. It's www.visioncamplive.com. But what we're here for is to talk to Rosalind Quay. And you may be thinking about this title, like the laws of life and living the law. Listen, there are deep spiritual principles that are relevant and evident in each part of our lives. Whether we're paying attention to them or not, we are moving and aligning ourselves with spiritual law by choice. Now, Rosalind and I go way back. We're going to get into this conversation. But what strikes me about her life and her transformation is that she is constantly evolving with the laws of how she dictated her becoming in this world. Whether it seems like it's all unfolding with ease or not, that's not the point. We'll get into that too, but help me welcome Rosalind Quay. Hey, Roz. Hi, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Hey, it is my pleasure. Listen, I gave you my introduction. Tell the people who you are in your own words. So my name is Rosalind Quay. I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio, and I now live in New York. And I guess we'll get into the backstory of, you know, all of that journey, but I have a corporate life where I've worked in powering utilities for over 10 years. And I'm also the founder and CEO of Pranayama Rose, which is my yoga venture where I help other professionals who work in STEM to overcome stress and chronic illness by adopting a holistic yoga practice. Love it, love it, love it. So you and I met 20 years ago right? I can't even believe this. 20 years, right? And at that time, we were both dancing in New York City. Uh, I had just launched this company called InSpirit. You were kind of one of the founding members, I believe. Like, like what, Back then, what was the trajectory of who you thought your future self would be, Roz? Back when we met? Yeah. Yeah. I So at the time, I was at Ailey in the certificate mm -hmm. program. And I was thinking, you know, I I made this huge departure from where I had been in undergrad because I studied engineering in undergrad. Took a huge leap of faith and a risk by coming to New York studying dance. And so it had to work or it had to work. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I saw myself um, living the, the artist's life, whether that meant, you know, working a couple of jobs and performing or being you know fortunate enough to end up with a contract with a company it had to work yeah so you know a lot of times people are saying it has to work or i'm going to fall back to plan b right like i love this mentality of like it has to work or it has to work right like that in itself May you made a decision. I think decisions are the hardest things for people to make. So I remember us, you know, touring, being in the company, and you always saying, you know, I'm going to go to law school. And all of us were like, what? Like, are you seriously? Like, you're going to just that? That seems like totally a jump. But for you, what was the bridge? Yeah, there was a time where 
I said, you know what? I'm in this. I was working in fitness at the time. So I was a personal trainer alongside the work that we were doing with the spirit. And I got to a point where I said, you know what? I would like more stability and to get into back to like a professional track. Mm -hmm. And so at the time, because I didn't, I mean, I became an engineer because I was exposed to some people in high school, like that came to my high school and talked about their careers. But I didn't have people that I knew who were engineers. And I didn't, I wanted to stay in New York, but I didn't perceive there to be a way to do that and also be an engineer and at the graduate level, right? Yeah. So I started speaking with some of my clients at the gym about what they were doing. I worked in, as a trainer and in membership sales as well. As well, so I met a lot of people, mm -hmm. and so I started basically interviewing my clients about their careers. And that, over time, understanding what it took to be an attorney and what they like about it, what they hate about it, and also having an interest for personal reasons in public international law at the time, I decided to go to law school. Yeah. So you went to law school. So here, here we are. Here we are, y'all. I, I just think this is, I, I wanted to talk to Roz about this because I think she's such an example of a life with no regrets, right? There's never a moment, I think, in any of this story that we're going to kind of decipher where you're like, oh, I should have done that, but I didn't, right? Like, it's always like, that's next. I'm going, right? So, so you went to law school and? And? It was, it was actually, it was interesting because I don't know if people have heard about the first year of law school, but it can be quite trying. It's like, it's unlike anything that you've done in, in life. And I also happened to be coming out of a marriage at the same time. And I moved out of my marital residence into the dorm at, at Fordham. Yeah. And so there was, it was like a, a huge upheaval of life as I knew it. And I even, I worked for a bit, even though it's not recommended that you work your first year of law school, but I did. And again, it, it had to, I just stuck with it. It had to work yeah. because I was reinventing myself literally. Yeah. 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 That reinvention, did you feel like at the time you knew that it was happening or was it happening while you were doing something else? Mm. Like, could you see the next stage or like, could you see Roz 2.0 at the time or you were just like, I got to get through this? It was more the latter. I have to get yeah. through this. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think that's, I just want to say that out loud, Rod, because I think a lot of people are sometimes misunderstanding transformation as if someone has their whole life planned out. And even when it gets hard, they just stick to the plan, right? Like the plan goes out the window. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you find yourself first year of law school, living in a dorm. How does that play out? I'm glad that I, that I did end up in the dorm. I had two other roommates who were also 1Ls and we were part of a, there was a, like a pre start of school year program that we all participated in. So we had a chance to form a bit of a connection before we started our actual classes. So that was good. And it was, it, it helped place me in this, this bubble which I think is is super helpful and necessary in the first year of law school. Yeah. And, and so, how, oh, sorry, go ahead. And yeah, so I was working part-time and then taking my classes and we were focused. We used to hold each other accountable. So we, we lived in a three bedroom apartment. That was the style of the dorm. Yeah. So we had a, a study room down the, the hall from where we lived. So we used to hold each other accountable, go there and, read our cases and outline and, and all of that. So. I love it. Yeah. I mean, it just kind of mimics like you, you know, 
for those of you who don't know, maybe some of you don't know what a first year law school is like, but there's probably more of you who also don't know what being in a dance company is like, right? Like it's like constant community all the time. You can't get away from people. You can't do the work without them, right? Like holding each other accountable is like holding each other inside the work, inside the space. So I love that you went from like a community to a community, right? People still being able to help you grow because nobody grows alone. Facts. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so how does the law career play out into now this kind of what you were telling me earlier about feel like you live two double lives with really <laughs> the same core value? Yeah. You know what? I could not have predicted that I would be in the industry I'm in, I'm in now mm -hmm. going into law school because there's this like traditional path where you go to law school, you get the best grades you can go work for a law firm for a few years. And then you either move up or out. Some people go in house. Some people go to government, like you see like firm life or government or nonprofit out of law school, but that's mm -hmm. not the direction my career took. There, the company I work at now is, is Con Edison, is our um, utility here in New York. So we offer electric, gas, and steam service to customers in the five boroughs, parts of Westchester, and then we have a sister utility, Orange and Rockland Utilities, that serves Orange and Rockland counties. What happened is the it was two CEOs ago, Kevin Burke was his name. He was a Fordham Law alum. And he came back to speak at the Corporate Law Center lunchtime talks. They used to have these this series of talks where they would invite alumni back to talk about how they use their law degrees. And he was an engineer and he was an attorney and he also went to business school. And a part that I skipped is that in my second year of law school, I ended up adding an MBA I applied for the, the joint JD MBA program. And so I started business school classes the spring semester of my second year. Just because you didn't have enough to do. I'm, I, just <laughs> don't know. I mean, maybe somebody else is hearing this the same way. I mean, just, you just, you, you were bored. <laughs> I, I want to understand. Well, you know, the classes that I enjoy in first year, I mean, property, contracts. I knew that I was interested in either the public international law path or uh, financial markets, mm -hmm. um, or commercial work. And the summer after my first year of law school, I actually I took summer classes, but during a study abroad experience in Ghana. And one of the classes I took was international human rights law. Okay. And my experience in that class helped me clarify that that wasn't the direction that I wanted to go in and that it would be like commercial work or financial. And so that's why I ended up adding the MBA. It's something I was interested in potentially right bef before I even started it in law school. Mm -hmm. But after the first year, I was able to gain more clarity. Okay, gotcha. And so that's how I ended up adding the MBA with a concentration in finance. Okay, just a little, I mean, you know. Yeah. Oh, a little overachiever. That's okay. I mean, I'm just saying most artists are, but I'm just keep going. Keep going. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> this uh, former CEO of Con Edison came, he spoke and I'm listening to his background. I'm like, oh, interesting. He's an engineer. He is an attorney and he went to business school as well. And so I started to investigate and it just so happened that the company was looking for a legal intern for the following summer. So that job was posted to our, you know, our career portal. Mm -hmm. And I competed for it and I was selected. And that's how I ended up at Con Edison. So the summer after my second year, I interned there. And I loved it because everything that I had studied was relevant in this one place. Engineering, law, finance, all within this this corporation because utilities for those who don't know they're heavily regulated it's a, a natural monopoly but in exchange for having exclusive rights to serve a geographic area there's a lot of scrutiny of how we run the business mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it was all all useful and fundamentally utilities are 
engineering, right, design, construction, and, and maintenance companies. You got, you know, pumps and pipes and wires and all that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. All your parts kind of came together in this one thing. Yeah. Now, you're at Con Edison, you're doing the thing you love, all the parts are going together. And so then what made you go into this other life? Because now she's she's still doing other stuff, y'all. We're going to get to it. What made you now be the founder and CEO of Pranayama Rose? So I'm going to fast forward because it wasn't, you know, I interned at Con Ed for a bit. Uh -huh. And I was fortunate enough that the general counsel at the time was an advocate, a fan of mine, and a sponsor, essentially an advocate. So I was able to be hired into the law department as a full-time attorney directly out of law school, which is typically awesome. the company That's that great. So I'm working there and then I ended up being recruited away by another executive in finance who left and became the CFO at a different utility in our area and worked in different roles. But then we come to this pandemic. Hmm. And even beforehand, I would say it was about like fall of 2019. Uh-huh. I felt like I wanted to teach because hmm. I have been practicing Bikram yoga 26 and two or hot yoga. People may know it as yeah. from the time I was at Ailey. So this was the early two thousands. I wasn't hmm. super consistent because you know, we had dance as well. And so oftentimes I, it, for me, I would be indifferent as to whether I took a ballet class or I went to yoga. Yeah. Right. But I hadn't really connected with the like the spiritual aspect of it or the fact that it was this whole system that there were eight limbs, not just the physical practice. Right. Mm -hmm. But I had gone on a couple of retreats in that intervening time. And I found it to be super helpful for me in the corporate space, mm -hmm. dealing with the stresses that come with that corporate life. Yeah. Then the pandemic hits and we have all of this extra time on our hands with a choice of how to use it. And I decided to become certified to teach at that time. Okay. And there was a particular person that I wanted to study under. I don't know if people know, but there was this like whole scandal with Bikram and he was I saw, like, I saw the doc I saw the Netflix. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So he left the country and I'm like, okay, so that's not an option. Uh -huh. But similar to dance, the way the that yoga instruction works, right? Imparting that knowledge on the next generation of teachers, there was there were people who were a part of training up other instructors. It wasn't just Bikram himself, right? There was a whole community that mm -hmm. nurtured new teachers, minted new teachers. So there was a particular person, his name was Craig Villani, who was the first ever director of teacher training for Vikram. And he was active. And I saw that, you know, they were supposed to have teacher training in March of 2020, then maybe April, and it just they couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And I was waiting. I was like, oh, are they going to take it online? Please take it online, please. And it happened. So in November, no, October of 2020, I was able to start. And so that's how I spent a good bit of my free time is learning. And I love the, the teaching style because it wasn't just about how to instruct people in the practice, but everything around it, right? The eight limbs, the philosophy, yeah. the yoga sutras the Sanskrit and learning about the stories and the classical texts. It was, it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like that, that just brings your lawyer brain right back in. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like the analytical, the contextualizing, the bringing the pieces together, the retelling the narrative, like um, for you, <clears throat> well, let's just explain to people just a little bit. So for those of you who are not as familiar with the practice of yoga and the entire um, I think, um, modality that is about spiritual and physical union. Please elaborate just a little bit, Roz, on the eight limbs that you're referring to, because most people are, are only uh, only 
I think, well versed in the asanas. Okay. Yeah. So actually, do I have the sutras? Yeah, I keep it handy. Yoga sutras of Patanjali. So there was actually um, Sage Patanjali who documented this eight limbed approach to mm -hmm. unity between mind, body, and spirit. And so there are uh, the first two limbs are about our relationship with ourselves and the external world, kind of like the moral code. Yep. And then we have asana, which people are familiar with the physical postures. The third, mm -hmm. limb, the fourth is pranayama breathing practice. And then um, five, arguably five through seven deal with meditation. Mm -hmm. And then eight is this like total union. Yeah. Kind of um, like a transcendence. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> I want to bring that up because I think what I see, so Roz and I were just checking in a little earlier, y'all, before we went live with y'all, because I, it has been 20 years since we know we've seen each other. Um, and thinking about, uh, she was like, I just feel like I'm living these double lives. And I was like, oh, but I think you're still in energy management on every side. Like Con Ed is energy management, yoga is energy management, right? And thinking about, especially prana, like how did you come to name your particular platform Pranayama Rose? Yes. I was thinking about, you know, which which of the segments of class I most resonated with. Yeah. And there's an initial breathing exercise. Technically it's a form of Ujjayi breathing, but mm -hmm. it's called Pranayama breathing. Uh -huh. And I said, also want to incorporate my, my name and the root of Rosalind is Rose. And the idea of pranayama is also right is breathing so i'm like breathing rose pranayama we call it pranayama rose okay uh huh uh huh yeah i love it um first of all y'all should go follow pranayama rose on ig right it's an online yoga platform the website will drop it beneath this video as well <clears throat> but one of the things that i know is that you know as we think about the laws of life and connectivity and connection we often, if we don't have that kind of outside eye, we might miss the places where we could connect or should connect. I mean, I think a part of your story that really resonates with me, Roz, is that there is no regret. Like there, if, if, you know, during COVID, many people were like, oh my God, I could die tomorrow. And many of them started to think about what they hadn't done, right? I don't see those spaces in your life, right? I hear that you're like, here's what's next. I'm going to do it. It has to work or it has to work right? There's no like, I'm going to try this halfway. I've never heard you say anything in a rehearsal or anything. I'm like, I'm just, I'm going to try it a little bit. I've never heard anything, even in this story that you're telling us tonight about the evolution of your career and ultimately the evolution of your identity was there, where there was any, mm, any half, you know, half hearted choices, right? Like you're either in it or you're not. Am, am I hearing that correctly? Does that feel like a part of the way you live your life? Yes, I would agree with that. You know, we we walk down the pathway. And from my perspective, it's like, if I'm going to do it, then I'll do it. I'm not going to look back. Yeah. And there's always something that I can learn from every experience. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And it brings us, it brings me back to like one of the reasons we started this podcast, right? Because people are like wisdom Wednesday. I mean, who gets to be wise? And I was like, wisdom is not permission. It's not consent and it's not authorization. It is the lived experience by which you make better choices for the next version of you, right? And I hear that in your story as well. And so really, I mean, maybe I'm asking the question that everybody's wondering, like, what's next? I mean, what what's left? Yeah, I don't know about more degrees. Sometimes people ask me what I'm going to do next. I don't, I think I'm done there, but yeah. that's not to say I won't continue to learn. Uh -huh. But especially with, I mean, with the practice of yoga, it's like the, the more I learn, the more I feel like I know nothing. Mm -hmm. And so I have to keep going there. And there's so much I want to study. 
but we have so little time. Yeah. Nonetheless, I am at a stage now where, you know, I'm working full time and guiding meditation. I've, I've started with focusing on what I'm, what I'm doing with the community at work. So I'll have a Friday session that I inherited actually from an employee who left the company. She was also a yoga instructor. And during the pandemic, during the shutdown, she started guiding these meditation sessions on Friday afternoons, just 30 minutes. And I came back to the company and had joined her sessions. And then at first I didn't want to disclose that I was also an instructor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And at that time, actually, I had just completed. So after the um, 26 and 2 training, I also took pranayama teacher training as well as meditation teacher training. And I was just wrapping up meditation teacher training when I I told her, you know, this is what I do. So if you ever need a sub or you want to go on vacation, let me know. Yeah. And then a few weeks later, she told me she was leaving the company. And so, yeah. you know. <laughs> I inherited her group. So every Friday afternoon, I'm guiding meditation for coworkers. And I ended up, I said, all right, I want to grow a community outside of of work Mm -hmm. and do it in a way where I can be consistent and present for people, even though I still have a full-time job. So I've been offering workshops, um, Workshop is to sounds like work. Not a <laughs> no, it's, a, it's a place where you learn. Yeah, you work yeah. out the learning. Yeah. Yeah. Meditation and journal <laughs> yeah. sessions. And at first I started tying them to celestial events like we had eclipse season or full moons, new moons, and the like. But um, I just share information, some aspect of yoga philosophy or explain mm-hmm. an aspect of the practice in more detail. Mm-hmm. And then we practice it. So I like to, people to understand why we're doing something, not just do Simon Says. Right? Yeah, so, yeah. So workshops, I'm continuing with that. And then I wrote an ebook, Meditation for Beginners. Okay. We'll yeah. drop the link below the, the video. Yeah, we'll drop it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, um, so that it comes in a bundle. So it, it walks people through what is meditation? What are the different styles? how to get set up to, to get started, and then overcoming common challenges that I've seen people have with it, like having a racing mind, for example, or yeah. finding time to be consistent. So it talks about that. And then there are five guided meditations, like recorded meditations that they get with the ebook mm-hmm. to help them get started with practicing. And I intentionally made them five minutes so that you know time isn't an issue. Right. There's that. And in the long run, you know, I'd like to see us have a vibrant community of people who are supporting each other on their journey and embracing different aspects of yoga practice. Yeah, yeah. I love this because w- one thing you brought up, <clears throat> um, which I think a lot of people go to when they don't find something they love, right? Like, in your evolution, you found this yoga practice, you found something that you love that can coexist and actually kind of also, I think, boost your level of proficiency in your day-to-day work, right? But when people, I mean, especially women in the pandemic who were like, I don't know if I like my job. I don't know if I like myself. I don't know if I know what to do. Let me go get another degree, right? Like it was, it was kind of like, standard operating procedure, right? Anytime people want to grow, they think sometimes school is the answer. But I think what you're illustrating, even when you're just like, I don't know about getting another degree, I'll keep learning. But right, it's that other level of freedom that allows you to say, I don't need the validation from a certain system to learn anymore. My learning is valid. My evolution is valid. And I found something that I love, which now can continue to teach me for the rest of my life. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think a lot of people get stuck in that loop of, well, let me just have more education. Right. And it's like, well, that first limb of yoga, right? Like you got to know yourself before you even know what's valuable for your learning. That's right. Yeah. 
Okay, so Roz, we're coming a little bit to the end of our time, but let me ask you the question of the season. Okay, um, the we add we have a question every season that we ask our guest, um, and this one this season the question comes from a quote by Don DeLillo that says the family is the cradle of the world's misinformation. Now we're asking all of our guests. Mm -hmm, yeah, we're asking all of our guests if they can think about something that they had to unlearn from their family unit that was misinformation that almost held them back from growing? The thing that stands out for me uh -huh. most starkly is I had to change my relationship with money. Okay. That's, I, a, big, that's a big one for a lot of people. Yeah. I... I mean, my, my mother was a single mother and I had a nice, comfortable middle-class upbringing. Uh -huh. I went to private schools and all of that. But when I got to college, I mean, it definitely was quite the, the expense and I was figuring out how to take care of myself. Not that she didn't help, but she just didn't have a lot of resources to be able to, to help. And yeah. There was, I would say, a lot of uh, fear or lack consciousness around mm -hmm. me. And I had to learn how to shed that. And it's it's still a work in progress. Yeah. Really knowing and believing that there is this infinite supply of abundance. Yeah. There's so much money circulating. Yeah. <laughs> right. There's so much energy, right? Again, so energy much. management, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. It's just energy, right? And not making money a big deal and recognizing that there are ways that we can give energy to receive energy back. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really all it is. Mm -hmm. And at every level, what used to be a big deal is no longer. Like how quickly do we spend a hundred bucks now? Whereas when we were in our twenties, we'd be like, yeah. oh, that's a, a lot. Yeah. Maybe not for everybody. But yeah, you're like a hundred dollars. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. And now it's mean. like like that. Yeah. It's almost like the out of the door tax. Yeah. 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 I mean, and and that's you know, if we inflation is a thing, and we know that that contributes to how much things cost as well. But I mean, mm -hmm. inflation aside, changing the mindset about what money is, it, feeling empowered about being able to, to, to capture it, if I may say that, right? And, and allowing it to flow freely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in and out. Yeah. yeah. So let yeah. me ask you a follow-up question because since you brought this up, <clears throat> so if you've had to change your ideas about money, have you also had to change your ideas about your own value? Yes. Mm -hmm. In what way? Absolutely. I think coming out of graduate school, it wasn't necessarily a, uh, like a confidence building experience for me. <laughs> right. uh -huh. And I didn't, uh, like I wasn't on law review. And for those who may not know, law review was that like after first year, grades are set. And then there's a certain segment, I think it's a top 10% of the first year law school class that is invited to law review. So it's a, it's a journal where they write articles about legal issues, but there's no, like the, the, com the competition, the way to get selected for it is to have the top grades. I wasn't that person. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what, you know, if I didn't get into a law firm, what was going to happen with me. And so in some ways it felt almost like, like a company that wanted to hire me would was doing me a favor and that's just not mm. the case, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not the case. And 
with every successive role that I've had, being able to match the work experience that I have with academic experience, I've become more and more powerful. A unicorn, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's been a process as well. Yeah. Actually, the, the there was a crucible moment earlier on in my career, and I'm glad I had it. Now, looking back at the time, it was very uncomfortable. Um, yeah. But it's what prompted me to start meditation. Because I had the like the physical yoga practice, but I wasn't meditating. Mm -hmm. But it was during that difficult time where I was reporting to this guy and I was like the only woman in this engineering department, It uh, the only female manager. It tried me and my confidence was definitely shaken, but mm -hmm. I was able to get back to myself with help from a couple of mentors and then of course meditation practice and support from family, friends. Yeah, yeah. I think it's I think it's a crucible that we all go through, right? Like at some point, who we've been and who we're becoming has a growth spurt. And in that growth spurt, we have to tell ourselves mostly who we're becoming so that we can teach other people how to treat us and establishing our own value then becomes a part of that next level of really giving people the true authentic version of ourselves, not selling ourselves short and not giving ourselves over to that that old mentality of scarcity and not enough when we know we are dwelling in an abundant universe, right? Like just continuing to know that over and over. So Roz, I'm so excited you decided to join us. We're going to drop the link to Pranayama Rose below this video. We're going to drop the link to her ebook below this video. You're wanting to start meditation. If you are someone who's been working in a corporate, envir corporate environment and you know that there's something more for you to do, I want you to take full advantage of Pranayama Rose and all the meditation classes and resources that they're having. And if you are ready to take the next step into building a life by design and not by default, if you're ready to live like Roz and have no regrets, make your way to Vision Camp Live Saturday, October 28th in Middlebury, Vermont, one of the most beautiful states at the most beautiful time of year for your transformation to jumpstart a life by design. Listen, Roz, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being such an example of courage. We'll see y'all next week here on Wisdom Wednesday. Have a good night. Thank you for having me. My pleasure.